What's up guys, Ryan Turk here. Hey guys, Chris Forsberg here. I just got back from uh, Grid Life. Sorry that my throat's a little raspy. We had a long, crazy weekend at Grid Life. Just drove for about 15 hours straight, so I'm a little tired. I got the GT4586 behind me, which is actually at my house for the first time ever, so it's pretty cool. So let's get to those questions. First question is from Jay Xenon. What's the difference between a low mount turbo manifold compared to a top mount turbo manifold? Also, love the video and shout out from New Zealand. Awesome. Thank you for the shout out. <coughs> uh, the difference between a low mount and a top mount is basically just how the turbo is mounted. If a turbo sits underneath the runners on the manifold, then it's a low mount or a bottom mount. And then if it's a top mount, it's just on top of the turbo manifold where the flange is. So the, sit actually, the uh, turbo actually sits right on top of the turbo flange instead of hanging off the bottom. And uh, that's, that's how it's done. We got Gooseman13 who asks, does every nut and bolt have a specific torque spec and, or is there a generic spec to use? Well, yes, every nut and bolt on a car and an engine specifically will have a torque spec. If you have a factory service manual, they'll give you all those specs for everything. But as you are working on a car and you have years of experience, and not that I recommend this when you're assembling an engine, you should always use a torque wrench, but when you're doing suspension parts and brakes and things like that, you kind of get a general feel of what is tight and what is right. And so with that, you know, going back to you, when you're doing an engine, you always want it to be 100% proper because those things will rattle themselves to pieces. But for us, when we're doing our suspension and brakes and everything else on the chassis, we'll just do a generic you know, hand tighten and you know, we'll follow through and check the car in between uh, runs or even events to make sure nothing's coming loose. Edgar Burrowman, how do you guys determine your guys diff gear ratio? What ratio are you guys using on the 240 and why? Um, I determine it based on what track we're going to and what transmission I'm, I'm running in the car. For the 240, I'm just running a stock SR gearbox with a stock 408 rear end, uh, which I don't like. It's not great for a lot of the tracks here in the Northeast. Uh, like Canaan up in here in New Hampshire, um, Thompson Speedway, and also, uh, you know, Raceway Park. You're better off having a higher gear ratio, like a 4.6 rear end in a 240 if you're running a stock transmission. But if you're going to a six-speed transmission, uh, the stock gear ratio is perfectly fine. So with that being said, uh, it kind of determines on what parts you have in the car. Next question we got is, hey Chris, in the beginning of the video, you were cutting up the front end of the Idiot's S4 team. Can you tell me what the benefits of doing this for drifting and how can I do it on my Skyline R33? Well, in that car, I was cutting out the wheel wells to make a little more access to the front suspension so when you're working on the car, it's easier to get to everything. The other reason why I cut it out is to get more clearance for the front wheels when you're driving at full lock. You'll notice when you look under the front end of a lot of cars, you get a lot of wheel rubbing marks on the inner wheel wells. And so what you want to do is clearance them out. Some guys will just cut and remove those pieces. Some people will recap them with front tubs and do a lot more tin work and sheet metal work. And that just takes a little more time. It does look nicer and does keep your engine bay cleaner. But for a track only car, I usually just cut it out and leave it open. Uh, you get a hammer and knock out those seams uh, so they're nice and flat on the back side of the wheel well and make sure you have plenty of clearance so you're not rubbing those front wheels. And to do it on your car, I recommend that you take a very close look at where the you know, spot welds of your front wheel well are. Try to never cut over the uh, double layer of sheet metal. I always cut right along the seam so that you still have that nice thick edge so that you don't have uh, you know, that flimsy sheet metal uh, banging around in there. And you, know, you wanna just be very careful and work your way slowly, don't just go in there full force to the very edge, you know, build it out to the edges and make sure that you're not cutting too far. Eric Selden, could I turbo my 2012 2.4 L, L4 Chevy Equinox? You can, you can pretty much turbo anything. Um, so yeah, I don't see why not, man. You're gonna have to get some custom parts. I don't know if they make anything off the shelf for that, but um, you can definitely turbo it. All right, next question is Michael Montella, who says, what's the best way to go about learning how to swap engines? Well, in this day and age, you got YouTube to tell you about pretty much anything. And I know we don't go over every single step on how to you know, remove and install the engine, but we try and cover the bases of some of the important things to look for. 
because when you're swapping an engine, it's no different than swapping a brake caliper, but there's just a lot more parts and a lot more bolts. And so you just have to have a good memory of where it all goes and how to hook things up. Um, you know, when you're doing like a brake caliper, you gotta make sure you put the brake line back on correctly, it's facing the right direction so it doesn't get ripped off. When the wheels are turning, you gotta re-bleed the brakes. And so these are all just like little things that you will learn as you start to swap engines. And if you're mechanically inclined, you know, I say to just dive in head first and do it. It's not that difficult. Removing the engine is, for lack of better words, as easy as removing all the mounts, removing all the fuel lines, and you know, going through the entire wiring harness and making sure that comes off. And then you can just lift that motor right up and out. And after that, it's just you know, reverse order. So if you're ever in question, you can always look online and there's gonna be someone that has already done it and they can help you with any tips that you need to get it back together. Colby sickest stance. This question is, Turk, what kit was on your S13 back in 2013? Uh, I don't know which S13 you're referring to, so I'll go through a couple different ones. On the um, on the 1JZ car, I just had inner tie rod spacers. I didn't even have cut knuckles or anything. It was just uh, basically stock. We're running those mountain roads. You're not really heavy, deep in angle anyways, and that's pretty much all I was doing with that car at the time. Um, missile car, I'm currently now running a WiseFab kit. And uh, back then, I think I just got my missile car, which had, yeah, just inner tie rod spacers as well. So I was running basically stock ass angle on everything, but it, uh, it worked perfectly fine. The missile car at the time just had a stock ass R in it and you couldn't really run deep angle anyway. So it, um, it, it did pretty well. Next up, we got VY for life who says, hey, Ryan and Chris, which way skate is best to run for drifting, internal or external? Now, it really depends on your application, but in the end, I would say that external waste gates are always gonna be better. They're more predictable, they have a larger diaphragm, you can get more exhaust flow and have a better uh, controlled boost situation. And that's the whole point of a waste gate, is to control your boost level so you don't get any spikes. Internal waste gates are hard to get them large enough to be able to direct enough exhaust around the turbo so that you don't get those boost spikes or boost creep as you're rolling up in the RPM and your boost kind of keeps rising with it. So I would always recommend going external. Sometimes internal is the easiest way to get a build done. And with the S chassis, the SR20 kits, a lot of those turbos come internally gated. And so we'll normally keep them that way until you're starting to make a lot of horsepower. Next question. This question I've actually been getting a lot, so I'm glad they chose this to uh, answer. It's from uh, It's ZB. Hey Ryan, what happened to your 1JZ S13? We haven't seen it in a long time. It's actually right over here. I don't know if we, you want to look at this one or do you want to look at that one. It's right underneath the tarp or car cover. It's, uh, it just needs some uh, new engine harness from my buddy from Unicorn Garage, new chassis harness, and then just uh, a good go through. Um, so I just haven't had time to rebuild that as I have too many cars that need too much attention all the time. So the uh, off-season project this year for me in my garage is going to be to rebuild the 1JZ S13. Alright, and lastly we got Pyro's Rock This World asks, Hey guys, are there any big differences between petrol and diesel turbos? Now actually they're very similar, although diesel turbos generally run bigger than turbos for gasoline engines because they make a lot more exhaust and they actually make a lot more torque. So, you know, when you're getting up there in the power numbers, you gotta have a turbo that can flow that same CFM. So on a diesel engine, you'll actually see what looks like a race size turbo hanging off the side of those things. And on like a little four cylinder, you're gonna see a pretty small turbo kind of tucked up underneath the manifold. So we've actually, you know, upgraded turbos on both of them. And it's just a very standard thing to always sort out what size turbo you need for your application, what power numbers you're trying to hit so that you get those CFMs right on the money. And that's gonna help you with the spool up time so you have the proper efficiency from the turbo setup. Last question, final, from Taylor's Adventures. Ryan, what are the specs on your white 240, such as engine, angle kit, coilovers, and horsepower? Um, the specs, uh, the engine is just an SR20, uh, Garrett GT 2871 turbo. Uh, run BC 264 cams, you know, nothing crazy is making about 300 and 300 horsepower at the wheels. Um, you know, Deech works injectors, um, you know, a little fuel system upgrade on it, and then the Apexy Power FC for tuning, and that's basically it. That thing, uh, that thing rocks. The angle kit is Wise Fab in the front, and the uh, coilovers are BC Racing, the BR series coilovers. So it's a really good setup, really good base for, uh, for a missile car. 
and uh, I wish I had like maybe 30, 30 more horsepower, which I'll probably do, but I'm gonna have to put some race gas in it uh, just to be on the safe side. So um, stay tuned for that. It's gonna be a good time. Well, that's it for this week's Drift Response. Thank you guys for all the questions, comments, the views, support, everything. Stay tuned for next week when we drop a new episode of Drift Garage. See you then.